So languages change over time. If you've ever been a student in an English literature class, you surely struggled with some Shakespeare plays. Although these plays are only around 400 years old, the English language has changed so much to the point where modern English speakers struggle to understand the text. Now what if we go even further back, all the way to Old English, which was spoken between the 5th and the 11th century? English looks like an entirely different language. So this begs the question, what will English look like in the future? Specifically American English. I mean, there's no possible way to predict how English will evolve exactly, but I'm gonna try anyway. Don't worry though, I won't be shooting bullets in the dark. I'll be basing my predictions on the current changes that are happening in the English language right now. But once again, these are just loose predictions. Think of it more as a conlang called Future English that is based on modern American English. Also, I'm going to be focusing more on how the grammar of English will evolve, as including sound changes will be a little too much for this video. Alright, so I previously mentioned how there are current changes that are occurring in the English language right now, but where can we find these changes? Well, we have to look at slang or casual speech, as this type of language is more innovative compared to formal speech. Keep in mind that a lot of these new features in English are being developed in African American vernacular English then they are slowly adopted into the mainstream. The spread of AAVE to the general population makes a lot of sense since it's made a lot of cool innovations that are really useful. For example, AAVE has a habitual tense, which general American English doesn't have. You most likely have heard it be used before or have even used it yourself. The habitual tense in AAVE is done by adding the word be before the verb, like he be working. This doesn't mean that he's currently working, but that he is in the routine of working. Because general American English lacks this habitual tense, many non-AAVE speakers have begun adopting this verb tense into their speech due to its usefulness. Because of this, I can easily see the habitual tense become a standard in the future. Another innovation that we have is left edge deletion. If you speak other languages like Japanese, you may know that it's a pro drop language, which is a language that emits pronouns. For example, if I see a cake that is half eaten on a table and there's only another person in the room with me, I could say, you cake ate? But because of the context, one can just look at that person and say, ate? You don't have to say the words you or cake since it's obvious from the context. All right, all right, but how does this relate to the English language? Well, English is starting to do a similar dropping of words from sentences based on the context, but it does it a bit differently. For example, imagine a scenario of two people talking. One asks the other, do you know a guy named Jacob in our class? Then, the other person quickly replies with, hate him. Now, traditionally, a sentence without a subject would suggest that this is a command, but that's not how it's being used here. The speaker skips using the pronoun I here because it's already obvious from the context, so rather than saying I hate him, they just say, hate him. Another example is a person who is running late to a meeting. They might say, gonna be late, rather than saying, I'm gonna be late. Once again, the subject is obvious, so it's dropped. So based on these examples, could we say that future English might become a pro-drop language? Well, no, because what's happening here isn't that the pronoun is being dropped, rather, the leftmost word in the sentence is being dropped. For example, take the sentence, are you going to the store? If we took out the pronoun here, it would sound completely ungrammatical, are going to the store. However, you going to the store sounds completely fine in casual speech. Here, the word R is being deleted, not the pronoun you. What's happening here isn't pro-drop, but rather something called left edge deletion. Also, it's not just one word that you can delete. For example, in the sentence, do you want to go, we can delete do and you to get want to go. We can even delete three items. It was a lovely day yesterday can become lovely day yesterday. I won't get into the nitty gritty details of how left edge deletion works since that's the job of a PhD person. But if you're interested in learning the mechanisms behind it, a source is cited in the description. All we need to know for this video is that left edge deletion occurs in casual speech and is happening more and more frequently, indicating that this could become a standard in future English. Before we delve deeper into future English, let's hear a word from today's sponsor for this video, LiveXP. If you're interested in learning more about spelling, pronunciation, grammar, or other aspects of present day English or any other language, how about giving today's sponsor a try? LiveXP is a cool platform where well, you'll be able to find language tutors for private one-on-one -on -one sessions. One of the things I struggled with the most personally when learning Japanese was finding a tutor that fit my learning style. Thankfully, with LiveXP, they'll analyze your learning style to match you with the perfect tutor so you don't have to go through the trouble of finding one yourself. On top of this, English learners receive personalized reading, listening, vocabulary, and grammar exercises based on your own level so you'll know exactly what areas you need to focus on for your studying. Click the link in the description and get a 30-minute trial lesson for only 99 cents by using the code THELINGOTTER30. And if you end up loving the service, you'll get a 30% discount by once again using code THELINGOTTER30 at checkout. Speed up your language learning with LiveXP today. Once again, thank you so much LiveXP for sponsoring this video and let's go back to future English. Next, let's talk about morphological leveling. To be more specific, the past participle of a verb is being replaced by the preterite form of the verb. For example, let's look at the verb to drink. 
Drink is in the present tense of the verb, while drank is in the past tense, the preterite. But there's also the participle form of to drink, which is drunk. This version of the verb is used when there is an auxiliary verb like to have before it. So technically it wouldn't be he has drank two sodas. Rather, it would be he has drunk two sodas. This change isn't too weird though since regular verbs already have the same form for both the participle and the preterite. For example, I jumped versus I have jumped. The only difference is that now it's occurring with irregular verbs like drink. Let me give you a few more examples. I've eaten becoming I've ate. I've gone becomes I've went. I can easily see these participle forms of verbs completely disappearing if this trend continues. Therefore, I would say that future English will probably no longer have the unique form for the participle. Another feature I think is slowly being added to the English language are punctuation marks being used in speech. Let's think about the slash symbol used often online. Although slash has only really been used in written works, it has been popping up more and more within speech. But why is that? Well, it's because it's really useful. You see, compare these two sentences, one using and and the other using slash. My friend and colleague always sang too loudly versus my friend slash colleague always sang too loudly. In the first sentence, and can either be intersective or collective. Intersective means that the two nouns are speaking of the same person. In other words, I'm only talking about one person. They are both my colleague and a friend. However, this sentence is ambiguous because the word and can also be a collective conjunction, meaning that these two nouns are describing two separate people. In other words, I'm talking about a friend and a colleague. This is where the usage of slash becomes extremely useful as it only has the intersective interpretation. With the second sentence, there's no confusion about whether or not I'm talking about one or two people. We know that the friend is also a colleague. As we begin to use slash as an intersective conjunction more and more, we might relegate and to only being used within collective instances. That's not all slash can do, however. When it comes to adjectives, it serves another useful purpose. For example, take these three sentences. John is injured and sick. John is injured or sick. John is injured slash sick. The first sentence uses and, so we definitely know that John is both injured and sick. He could have broken his leg and gotten pneumonia at the same time. Meanwhile, the second sentence is using or, which suggests that he has to be either one or the other, but not both. However, in the third sentence, it uses the word slash, and that gives another unique meaning. In this sentence, we are suggesting that John is either injured or sick, but he can also be both. We don't really know. Unlike the words and or or, the conjunction slash allows for more combinations of injured and sick. Although it's really weird that slash is becoming a new word in the English language since it's a conjunction, and conjunctions are a part of a group called the closed class, meaning that it's really rare for new conjunctions to be added into the language. Compare that with nouns, verbs, and adjectives, which are an open class. We constantly are adding new words to these categories all the time, so the fact that we have successfully adopted a new word into a closed class category is extremely interesting. As we use the word slash more and more, I can easily see it sitting next to and and or as important conjunctions in the English language. Speaking of punctuation marks, I've also noticed that people are starting to say the phrase question mark out loud at the end of their sentences. Now, this is relatively new, so there aren't many studies done on the topic yet, so I decided to ask you guys about why people are saying question mark. The most common answer I found was that sometimes you say it declared a statement like he's at the park but then quickly cast doubt onto what you just said so you add question mark at the end of the sentence basically he's at the park question mark will mean something like hey i just said that he's at the park but i'm not entirely sure on that fact this is extremely interesting since it appears that the phrase question mark is taking on a role of a sentence ending particle take mandarin for example they add ma to the end of yes or no questions what if this question mark became so common in the future that it started acting similarly as the ma in mandarin but rather than a question particle it's a doubting particle, a word to end your sentence to explicitly show doubt about what you said. Of course, this is just a little thought that I had about the usage of question mark. I'm sure there are linguists at the moment attempting to figure out the exact meaning of the spoken phrase. Moving on from punctuation marks, let's look at the phrase let's. Many people haven't noticed this, but let's is no longer just a contraction of the phrase let us. Imagine this scenario for instance, you and your bestie are currently being kidnapped, so you yell out let's go. Doesn't this sentence sound weird? I mean, if let's was simply a contraction of the two words let us, then it should have the same meaning as the phrase let us go. This difference in meaning between let's and let us clearly shows that let's has taken on its own form. It seems that the phrase let us can serve two functions, asking for permission and giving a suggestion. For example, let us go can be asking for permission, like in a kidnapper scenario, but also it can be a formal suggestion. Like imagine a prince telling a princess let us go. Here, 
He isn't asking permission, he's giving a suggestion to the princess. Meanwhile, the contraction let's can only be used for suggestions, but never to ask for permission. Another way to think about it is in terms of the participants of the action. Let's use the kidnapper scenario once again. Within the phrase let's go, you're including yourself as a participant of the action, suggesting that you and the kidnapper should go together. Meanwhile, in the phrase let us go, you're excluding yourself from being a participant of this action, so only the kidnapper is doing the action of letting go. This is why let's go sounds so weird in this scenario. If you say let's go, you're giving a suggestion to the kidnapper of what you yourself and the kidnapper should do, which is to go. Of course, the full phrase let us go can also be used as a suggestion, but it sounds really formal now. In terms of how this will evolve in the future, I can see let us losing its suggestion meaning as let's becomes the dominant form used for giving suggestions. We will still use let us of course, but only for asking for permission. All right, this is the part of the video where I'm going to get really crazy with the English language. This is going to be extremely hypothetical. So once again, this is more of just a fun concept based on the current changes that are happening in the language. I'm going to be talking about the semi-modal verbs and how they might evolve in the future. Specifically, I'm going to talk about the constructions such as want to, going to, have to, and ought to. As you may know, these phrases take on a different form in casual speech. Rather than want to, going to, have to, and ought to, we say wanna, gonna, have to, oughta. Similar to the situation of let's no longer being the exact equivalent equivalent of the phrase let us, the shortening of want to, going to, have to, and ought to are not necessarily equivalent to wanna, gonna, have to, oughta. For example, take the sentences, I'm going to eat food and I'm gonna eat food. Here it appears that gonna is just the shortening of the phrase going to, but look at this. I'm going to the park and I'm gonna the park. The second sentence here is ungrammatical, showing that gonna can only be shortened in specific contexts. Basically, the phrase going to can be used in two completely different ways. One is to indicate the future tense by combining going to with a verb. On the other hand, when used with a destination, it indicates movement slash direction. The phrase gonna can only replace going to within the first scenario. This goes for the other semimodal verbs as well. Wanna plus verb. Hafta plus verb. Ada plus verb. As gonna slowly diverges from its original meaning of going to, we can imagine a world where this phrase slowly turns into a grammatical suffix. Actually, we don't really have to imagine because it's already happening with the pronoun I. For example, we can say I'm going to, but we can also say I'm gonna, or we can go further and say ama, but let's spell it differently to make it easier to read. I, ma, e. In fact, let's make a table of conjugations to see how gonna might evolve in the future. So, gonna has become ma in the first person, but we actually have some dialects that are turning gonna into just ga, with the a uh becoming a nasal vowel. For example, you gon' eat, he gon' eat, they gon' eat, we gon' eat, y'all gon' eat. And all of a sudden, English has developed a new modal verb. Not only that, but it has an irregular conjugation for the first person, ma. This evolution is not that strange, since a similar thing happened to the modal verb will. First, it was used as an entire construction like, I have a will to eat, or I have the will to eat. But slowly over time, it became just will. So, future generations of English speakers may be confused as to why the phrase ga expresses the future tense and why all of a sudden it turns into ma in the first person. But us normies in the present know exactly why that happens. All right, so going to and the other semi-modal verbs may develop into becoming full modal verbs like will. But will the word will evolve into something further? I mean, it can, but we don't really know. I'll give it my best shot though. There's this theory called the decline of grammaticality created by the linguists Hopper and Trago, who attempt to figure out the evolution of how languages adopt new grammatical suffixes. It goes like this. Something first starts out as a content word, then becomes a grammatical word. We have seen this with the words gonna and will, where will used to be used as an entire phrase like I have the will to eat, but slowly became just will, which is a grammatical word now. According to the decline of grammaticality, the next step after this is becoming a clitic, which is exactly what is happening right now. Will is turning into ul, being attached to the pronouns like I'll, will, they'll, you'll. Let's say in the future, this step is fully completed and the modal verb will is no longer used. We simply add ul to the pronoun to indicate future tense now. What would be the next step? Is there a next step? Well, according to the decline of grammaticality, the final step is for a clitic to become an inflectional suffix. Theoretically, the ul clitic can start attaching to the verb itself. So rather than I'll need your help, we might say I needle your help. Essentially, we would now have a new conjugation ul to indicate future, much like how ed indicates the past tense. Just for fun, let me go even further with this. From this point on, there's like no theory or anything. So this is just all speculation from my part, but it's fun speculation. Let's say that rather than ul jumping from the pronoun to the end of the verb, 
the u takes the pronoun with it and attaches to the verb. So rather than I go, we might get something like algo. Let me break this down for you. The a prefix would indicate the first person, while the o will indicate future tense. Imagine this happens with every pronoun. He'll go becomes he'll go. They'll go becomes they'll go. You'll go becomes you'll go. Y'all go will become y'all go. Now we have a conjugation table that looks like this. Similar to Spanish, the verb tells us both the tense and the subject now. Essentially, English has become more grammatically complex, but less words are needed to convey the same information now. We went from saying, I have the will to go, to I'll go. Once again, this is purely hypothetical, but this kind of shows how different conjugations can come about. They may start out as full phrases, but are shortened so much that they start attaching to surrounding words, giving us new suffixes or conjugations. I mean, that's what happened with the suffix full. It started out as x full of y, but eventually became x is y full. Anyways, you can probably tell that at the start of the video I started out with the most probable changes, but then slowly it delved into chaos deeper and deeper into the theoretical. Even if it's all speculation, it gives us a good insight on how grammar can develop in language over time. Before I end this video, I want to say thank you to my Patreon supporters, Derek Moore, Hayim, Brayden, Warden Actual, Manrock1, Michael McNay, and Pango. Anyways, that's it for me, but thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Ciao.